Great. Thank you, Dick. Um, and thanks to the Association of Lifelong Learners at Alpena Community College and the Friends of Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary for uh, allowing us to, to bring this distance learning uh, presentation to your living room. Uh, it's a small way that, that we enjoy being able to share uh, some educational content for you guys on a, uh, on a Thursday morning. Um, I'll admit this is the first uh, public presentation I've ever given in sweatpants, so we're just going to have to see how this goes. Uh, my name is Phil Hartmeyer, as Dick mentioned. I'm a maritime archaeologist at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and I'm contracted by Cardinal Point Captains. Um, I serve as a maritime archaeologist here and, and unit diving supervisor for the sanctuary. And today we're going to look at one of, the, uh, one of my most favorite parts of my job, um, which is the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary's approach to and, and execution of marine remote sensing surveys. Um, like Dick mentioned, uh, as far as questions go, please hold those guys until the end, but you're welcome to, uh, to enter them into the chat windows uh, that Dick mentioned. The Office of National Marine Sanctuaries uh, represent a system of 14 sanctuaries and one National Marine Monument. These sites are some of the most treasured underwater places in the United States and its territories. Sanctuaries, uh, they specialize in different research, education, and outreach obje uh, objectives, but they all strive to connect people to the water and the resources that lay beneath the waves. Currently, Thunder Bay is the only national marine sanctuary located in the Great Lakes uh, and was designated in the year 2000. Now there is traction and some exciting community support for future sanctuaries along Lake Michigan's middle coast in Wisconsin and in upstate New York on Lake Ontario's southern shore. But for us here at Northeast Michigan, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is a 4,300 square mile preserve that is co-managed by the state of Michigan and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. This corner of the Great Lakes is known as Shipwreck Alley due to the tens of thousands of vessels that have passed our shores, making way to Lake Superior, over to Lake Michigan, or downbound to the lower lakes. Nicknamed Shipwreck Alley, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary represents the crossroads of the Great Lakes where over 100 wreck sites have been found with another 100 yet to be discovered. Their stories pervade local, regional, and national maritime heritage contexts and are some of the most well-preserved shipwrecks on this planet, thanks to the cold, icy waters of Lake Huron. I hope after today, you'll have a better hydrographic survey vocabulary and understand the workflow and tools used to discover cultural resources here in the sanctuary. To meet this objective and my allocated time restrictions, I'm going to purposely skim on some topics and emphasize, and emphasize others. So if you have any follow-up questions beyond this uh, live stream video, of course, uh, my email is gonna be uh, at the end of the presentation. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. Now, diction is important in the world of survey. When we talk about hydrographic survey or marine remote sensing or just survey in this context, we're talking about the science of obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance. From a distance can mean from the air, from the water surface or from underwater, and perhaps most importantly, must be done systematically. Survey is an important tool that helps us fulfill research and management objectives outlined in our management plan. We use survey data to characterize, interpret, discover, and share natural and cultural resources located in the sanctuary. So who uses this data? Well, a lot of people. Biologists from DNR Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife can identify fruitful fish spawning habitats that can help them decide where to release stocked fish. Geologists study survey data to answer questions about the Great Lakes glacial history and the submerged karst labyrinth of underground rivers who stretch across the lakes. In our corner, we use survey data to identify and discover significant cultural resources to bring their stories and histories to the public eye. And of course, the public uses them too paper and electronic nautical charts that help keep recreational and commercial mariners safe are all generated from remote sensing data. Commercial products that we use every day that are shipped by water depend on accurate survey data to confirm safe water depths in harbors, channels, and shipping lanes for freighters to safely navigate. Lake bottom bathymetry and topography can guide fishermen to fruitful fishing grounds, and the list goes on and on. The beauty of it all is that with current technology, we can answer all of these questions 
and help all of these partners by scanning the lake bottom once. There was a common phrase in the survey world that accurately characterizes how we approach survey. Ping once, use many times. Now it's worth noting that our remote, marine remote sensing surveys are rarely exclusively based on shipwreck discovery. Um, this data acquisition applies to all of these different partners who we regularly collaborate with. So getting started at the historical research phase of shipwreck discovery, um, in the sanctuary, of course, 100 shipwrecks are known and have been identified, but for the 100 estimated that are yet to be discovered, the first step is historical research. We're looking for clues that can help answer questions like, when was it last seen? What port did it leave? What was the wind direction and weather conditions of the day on its final departure? Where was it going? To answer these questions, we dip into the historical record. Here in Alpena, we're incredibly fortunate to have several maritime collections housed within the special collections department of the Alpena County George N. Fletcher Public Library. Eric Magnus, Marla Broad, Don Labar, Patrick Labadee and their staff do an incredible job providing physical and digital access to the nearly 14,000 vessel records housed at the library. These vessel records contain enrollments, historic images, and newspaper clippings. Now, similar collections exist in other places across the lakes, of course, um, Bowling Green State University, Central Michigan University, Wisconsin Maritime Museum, and others. Um, but these collections were often personal collections at one point that have been donated to these archival institutions for preservations. So in essence, these collections often represent what one or many historians found important enough to keep. And we are, of course, forever in their debt. Now, another depository for this information in the historical uh, research side is, of course, the National Archives. Um, there are two branches in, in Washington, D.C. and in Chicago. Now, oftentimes, local collections like those found at Alpena County Library are more robust and more organized than these national collections, but occasionally it's the reverse. They have similar records but are challenging to navigate and sort as their collections, of course, go far beyond the maritime world that we're interested in. But if you're there and have some time, there are some gems locked in the dust that have provided important data to sanctuary archeologists. Uh, these images you see here on the slide are, are snapshots from a 2015 trip I took down to Chicago, um, where I gleaned new historic data on over 40 individual shipwrecks that wrecked in Thunder Bay or have strong ties to the region. Now, in addition to those individual wreck site information, um, there, we also digitized regional US life-saving service wreck reports, um, life-saving station logs, port records, enrollments, uh, vessel inspection reports, and all of this data has been transferred and added to the collection at Alpena County Library. Gathering as much historical data on individual shipwreck sites is critical to approach the question, where do we think this is? Great. So we're done. We've got our historical research in hand, at least enough uh, to get dangerous as far as where we're going to begin searching. So then we're taking all that information, those discussions into a geospatial software system, ArcGIS, Google Maps, uh, Google Earth, those kinds of softwares um, can use to plot uh, individual polygons. And we take these polygons and we take the average depth of the areas, the areas and square miles of these polygons. And by polygons, I'm referring to on this uh, picture example here, the red and the blue uh, shapes there are areas where we're uh, interested in looking for something. In this case, it's a benthic habitat survey uh, up in Lake Superior. But using the average depth of the area, the square miles, how we're expecting the equipment to perform, what equipment we're using, we can calculate a time to complete uh, figure where we know what we're getting into, we know how long it's going to take, uh, and those kinds of things that are important in the survey planning process. Of course, we take all this data uh, in addition to the historical research and bring that onto the research vessel uh, to begin survey. Of course, another part of survey planning is, is, is drawing lines plans, right? Um, lines plans that are created based on our expected equipment performance. You know, vessels then, you know, mow the lawn going back and forth line by line until those polygons are covered. Now these lines plans can be used from anything from, a, from an aerial drone uh, to a side scan survey, et cetera. So once we have our targeted areas that we wanna survey, we have to evaluate its environment. Is it deep, is it shallow, it's somewhere in the middle. Depending on where we're headed and what level of survey we're after, we might use different technologies. 
Now, shallow inshore areas can be some of the most difficult areas to survey, with some minor exceptions. Um, Demetrios pictured here is, is beached in Greece, uh, and I think we can all agree that you don't need to be a hydrographer to discover this shipwreck. But on the other hand, if we look at this incredible side wheeler Albany, uh, beautifully imaged by our friend Brian Dort of Photic Zone um, and sunk here in Presque Isle County, discovering a site like this is trickier than it looks. Aerial imagery, whether it be drone based, like in this example, or satellite imagery, uh, is the best way to remotely discover wrecks like these. Um, sure, you could stumble across a site like this just by looking over the side of your boat, um, but if you didn't know where it was, you'd be searching for a while. So again, remote access, remote sensing survey, um, getting into some more uh, techniques and methods that we use in shallow inshore uh, surveys. Um, this is a snapshot of, of a project we did in 2017. Um, it was uh, uh, the Office of Ocean Exploration Research, a grant funded project to test the uh, viability of using unmanned aerial systems to map shallow water areas uh, looking for significant cultural resources. Um, it's taken a snapshot of what we did off a test site at the end of the North Point Peninsula in Thunder Bay. Um, simple quadcopters, right? There's uh, nothing terribly fancy here deploying them from shore and collecting these ortho mosaics of stitched individual photographs of a given area. And so what we did is we took those aerial imageries taken by the drone, we took our, uh, you know, we took GPS locations of known uh, archaeological material. In this case, it's, it's mostly broken pieces, fragments, uh, timbers, scantlings, things that have washed ashore or somehow beached in this lim uh, liminal zone. Um, and those are identified by the yellow dots here in the map. But of course, there's new stuff out there. And that was the sort of one, of one of the biggest results of this test was, can we not only ground truth what we already know about, but can we find additional uh, objects of interest for archeologists to then deploy, do a snorkel survey, record, uh, et cetera. In this dynamic environment, a lot of these types of material are shifting constantly. And so a drone is a uh, relatively a low cost uh, way to deploy an overhead view of the coastal liminal zone. Of course, beyond drones, um, you know, aerial surveys are, are certainly not new to the field of shipwreck and resource discovery. Um, the first satellite images of Earth were taken on August 14th, 1959 by the US Explorer 6. Since then, satellite imagery has improved dramatically to the point that we know and enjoy today. Now, unmanned aircraft have taken these data products to new heights pun absolutely intended. Um, and aerial imagery is just is not limited to what an optical camera can see through its lens, uh, however, in, in the case of LIDAR. Um, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. It's a remote sensing method that measures distance to a target by illuminating the target with laser light and measuring the reflected light with a receiving sensor. So differences in laser return times and wavelengths can be used to make digital 3D representation of the ground. Similar to the mosaic that you see here on the slide, LIDAR data is collected on manned aircraft and data sets are regularly updated by operators like US Army Corps of Engineers, USGS, NOAA, et cetera. And for us in the maritime world, LIDAR is, is an interesting data set because um, laser can penetrate on calm, clear days up to 10 meters in, uh, of water depth. So as long as the, uh, as long as the, the lake shore is, is calm, we can be able to see into that coastal liminal zone and use that data as we would uh, if we collected ourselves on a research vessel. So um, great stuff there with LIDAR. And there's other ways, of course, to, uh, to survey in shallow coastal zones um, that employ uh, divers and snorkelers. Um, Kelly here has shown tow boarding in the, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which Looking at it right now, uh, looks a whole lot nicer than towboarding at Thunder Bay uh, at this very day uh, here in a cold uh, late day in April. But towboarding essentially puts a, a snorkeler in the water, uh, getting towed behind a boat at slow speeds. The snorkeler is holding onto this dive plane. You can see she's got this yellow piece of plastic in front of her. Uh, when the snorkeler sees something at the bottom, they can invert the dive plane uh, and quite literally dive down to the lake bottom to get a closer look. If they find something, they simply let go of the dive plane, keep their eyes fixated on that target at the lake bottom until the dive boat can circle back and deploy divers in a, uh, in a marker buoy to be able to uh, take a closer look. 
Um, I've included a couple slides on uh, some diver surveys. Um, this, of course, first one being the swim line search. It can be done if snorkelers, uh, by snorkelers, if they can clearly see the bottom, uh, or by divers if they can't. Now, it's two or more bodies essentially swimming a line that's perpendicular to a guideline with the person on the end carrying a marker buoy so the surface support can see uh, that they're completely covering the search area. Um, a jack stay or corridor search is another in-water survey technique where divers can swim back and forth between two parallel search line limits, uh, identified by, of course, the marker buoys here in the illustration, and they leapfrog each other until the area is completely covered. Um, snag line is a, is a little different, but along similar lines where uh, two divers drag a, a reasonably taut line near the bottom across two parallel transects in efforts to snag features that have some kind of relief off the bottom. It's certainly handy in shallow, murky water when complete visual survey coverage isn't necessary or you're looking for something that you're expecting to find. Divers can also use circle searches to locate submerged cultural resources and visually survey a given area. Um, two divers are spaced at the limits of visibility underwater and they swim around a fixed marker buoy or an anchor. The diver furthest away uh, from the marker buoy is carrying a reel whose dummy end is secured to that anchor and then the divers are watching their compasses and they make progressively wider and wider circles around that target. Surface crews can record the GPS positions of those anchors via a uh, surface buoy and with some geometry they can plot exactly where the divers have swam and thus survey. Of all the diver surveys I've mentioned here, this is probably the one we use most underwater. Uh, if we're trying to relocate a mooring block or if we get dropped off a shipwreck site and we're close enough to be able to navigate towards it underwater, uh, we'll use this. But again, uh, these are very specific smaller level searches and surveys, but nonetheless, it's still a way to survey. So far, we've talked about what survey can be uh, and focused on shallow coastal applications that use satellite, diver, unmanned, and manned aircraft methods. Um, survey in shallow water is, is, is challenging, it's time consuming, um, and, and, and for now, we're going to take a quick leap and shift into offshore environments um, that we're going to call roughly 10 meters of water depth. Now, it should be noted that the tools and the techniques I'm about to discuss can absolutely be used in what I'm calling that shallow coastal zone, but I've separated them into this deep water applications uh, where we use them most uh, here in Thunder Bay. Uh, research vessels, of course, are one of the biggest differences between offshore and coastal survey planning. Um, the research vessels pictured here uh, are all used in survey at varying degrees and are managed by uh, our friends and partners at NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. In the top left is Thunder Bay's primary research vessel Storm. It's a 50-foot retired U.S. Coast Guard search and rescue platform that was uh, renovated and rebuilt in 2008 as a dive and survey platform. Um, 5501 in the top right is a NOAA Great Lakes workhorse that is a uh, key to our mooring system installations, but is also used for oceanographic sensor recoveries, buoy recoveries, et cetera. And uh, on the bottom left is NOAA Great Lakes flagship research vessel Laurentian, an 80 foot trawler that is preferred for surveys executed under 24 hour operations, um, designed to be able to have a crew go out and stay out uh, and be able to be pinging all day and all night. Um, R3011 down in the bottom right is our uh, small boat, our runabout, if you will, and is a retired NOAA's Office of Coast Survey Navigation Response Team survey vessel um, that can easily support uh, survey uh, equipment with, um, with just a few hours of, of moving some equipment around. Uh, when we talk about survey, um, I shot this uh, this little corny video when we we got some we got a new GoPro a couple years ago. But I think it serves a good purpose to illustrate uh, what survey is like on a research vessel uh, like Storm uh, with a with a crew of two. Um, lots of corny jokes, lots of Fritos, lots of books on tape, lots of discussion about politics. Anything you can imagine. Uh, there's plenty of time. Uh, to get to know uh, the crew who you're sailing with. Um, pictured here is, uh, is NOAA Captain Travis Smith, um, also contracted by Cardinal Point Captains uh, and working for us here uh, out of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary Office. So even for a vessel like Storm, we can survey uh, with two people, but three are preferred. Um, you can see here in the galley in the cabin, all of the survey equipment is situated kind of off that uh, forward port end, the helm being to starboard. Um, and then on the back deck, we've got 
you know, 100 meters of cable, uh, fiber optics that can then connect um, uh, any kind of equipment, towed equipment arrays off the back. Now, offshore survey is certainly not a new discipline by any means. Um, humans have been collecting water depth data since uh, we started navigating our coasts and our oceans. Uh, in the 1790s, Congress actually authorized specific lead line surveys to update and create nautical charts. Uh, and then just a few years later in 1832, NOAA's Office of Coast Survey was created and has begun uh, collecting hydrographic data ever since. Of course, sonar uh, was invented sometime after that uh, and is short for sound navigation and ranging. And some of the earliest sonars at the beginning of the 20th century were actually used to detect submerged icebergs, which became all the more important after a ship we all know sunk in 1912. Uh, some years later, the technology was, was militarized for submarine detection, um, and it wasn't until the 1950s that side scan sonar was developed and quickly adopted by Coast Survey and others to map the ocean floor. Multi-beam echo sounders were developed here later and have become standard operating equipment for surveyors everywhere, including us here in Thunder Bay, interested in mapping the sanctuary and identifying those locations for the 100 plus estimated shipwrecks left to be discovered. Great slide here, uh, thanks to our friends at Coast Survey showing uh, some of the uh, advantages of this newer technology, how much more we can search uh, with multi-beam versus single beam and lead line, of course, in the past. We truly have the tools to uh, quite literally uh, conquer this, this latest frontier uh, of our ocean floor uh, with multi-beam technology now. But of course, perhaps the, uh, the most important aspect of any survey is positioning. No matter what tool you're using, they're completely ineffective if you can't return to any specific geographical location. Imagine you're collecting bathymetry or water depth data using the most advanced technology available to map the LA Long Beach shipping channel. Now, while the data would look pretty, it's absolutely worthless if it can't be geo-referenced to a certain degree of accuracy. Now for LA Long Beach, every extra foot of draft allowed for the port yields roughly $2 million of extra products that ships can load. So precise horizontal positioning of survey data is absolutely critical in this realm. Now for us in Thunder Bay, we don't have the means or even really the need to collect data at that level of, this, of horizontal accuracy, um, but we do follow coast survey specifications for collecting chart standard full bathymetric coverage surveys. And there are a couple ways to do this, to collect positioning data that provide varying levels of accuracy and uncertainty. We use currently what's called differential GPS and real-time kinematic positioning, uh, getting our soundings within a meter or two of the survey vessel's positioning, depending on the depth of water that we're in. Now for differential GPS, the research vessel is actually triangulating its position based on signals received from at least four satellites whose position in the atmosphere and perhaps more importantly, whose timing uh, on, on atomic clocks is known. Now the receiver, which is on the boat, calculates the distance between the boat and each satellite, which helps triangulate vessel position. Now it's important to note that satellite signal transmissions aren't consistent or static. Think of when your GPS signal on your phone is reduced when you're surrounded by tall buildings in a city. Satellites are affected by objects, environmental conditions, and different layers of the atmosphere, including the ionosphere, that affect the accuracy of transmission. Now there are systems, softwares, and terrestrial base stations established to receive those signals and apply corrections to those signal errors and improve final positioning. Um, the Atlantix Pause MV is a widely used system that we use uh, and integrate into our survey platforms to translate, correct, and improve positioning. The system requires two GBS antennas. Those are those white conical pancake looking devices uh, which are correlated to generate heading. So the survey system knows exactly in what direction the vessel is moving. Now the uh, yellow cube in the bottom right picture is called an inertial motion unit or IMU, uh, a really important piece of gear here that is incredibly sensitive to uh, measure the pitch, roll, and yaw and heave of, uh, of vessels, which of course naturally have an effect on data quality and positioning. If you have your boat constantly getting affected um, by even the smallest uh, factors uh, of uh, surface conditions, obviously that affects the positioning, uh, beam forming, all those kinds of things. So when we talk about sonar, we're talking about emitting acoustic signals from the boat or a towed array 
to the ocean floor and then measuring the time that it takes for that signal to return. Survey is, is highly uh, depth dependent, um, but let's use this rough example uh, to illustrate the relationship that depth has with sonar. Now this is a flashlight beam uh, and everything within the beam, everything that's illuminated represents our sonar footprint on the bottom of the ocean. The echo sounder, of course, in this case is the flashlight itself emitting um, that light uh, with the object here, two screws and a couple washers uh, being the object that we're looking to image. So therefore the depth between the echo sounder or the sonar, in this case, the flashlight and the object is the depth of water that we're in. So if we increase our depth, which is the distance between that object and the flashlight or the sounder, the echo sounder, um, we can see how we can see uh, a, a larger and expect a larger footprint on the ocean floor as we're expanding our depth profile. So the deeper the water, the more that we can see with current technology. Great, we found a skateboard. So imagine that flashlight analogy applied to shipwreck exploration. There are fantastic tools at gathering high resolution imagery uh, of the ocean floor in a feature development setting. Um, oftentimes, side scan is towed behind a research vessel, uh, and the power of the sonar affects how deep it can emit and receive acoustic signal returns. Now, acoustic waves are emitted outwardly from the towfish, and by installing a sonar on a hydrodynamic carrier, or the towfish in this case, um, we can control where the sonar is in the water column, the altitude, and dial that in based on the individual sonar's capabilities, where it likes to fly in the water column, and what kind of imagery data uh, we want to gather. This is a great example uh, used by NOAA's Office of Coast Survey to illustrate how we interpret side scan sonar data. So take a look at this. Imagine we're looking straight down at the bottom of the sea and we find these strange looking beasts here. Um, now, sometimes shadow, right? Because we're emitting sonar, we're emitting acoustic waves sideways. And of course, there is a shadow with objects that are higher off the bottom, right? The ocean is not flat. In this case, uh, a herd of camels uh, is, is the example here. So acoustic shadow interpretation is critical in, in analyzing shipwreck sites, especially those too deep to dive. And we, we run many passes over a given target to get different angles that can provide more information. They can provide rough measurements of how tall the site is off the bottom, what it would look like if we were standing on the lake bed, uh, staring straight at it, for example. A couple few examples of how different sonar passes of the same target can tell us different things. Um, from the image on the bottom left, the target's acoustic shadow looks like uh, an apartment building. Um, whereas the image on the top, uh, obviously it looks like there is something narrowly uh, impacting and impaled in the lake bed, almost sticking out like a lawn dart. Uh, this is target two discovered in 2017. We're gonna get back to this here soon. This image illustrates uh, a little differently what side scan data collects in a cross section view. Of course, the red waves are acoustic waves being emitted from the sonar and return after they hit uh, a large object or the, or the ocean floor. And you can see that um, returns vary based on the density uh, of that object. And of course, it's height off the bottom. So uh, something that's sitting a little higher above the, uh, the lake bottom has a bigger shadow. Now, side scan has its own set of challenges and limitations. Um, lack of pre precise positioning is the biggest one, right? Every time we add um, uh, links in the chain that can affect uh, precise positioning is, uh, is something that we have to accommodate for, right? So we have to accommodate additional sources of error, like the lateral movement of the fish underwater, effects of sea state on fish position, et cetera. Um, and of course, maintaining safe altitude. Um, altitude is, is collected real time by the, by the towfish and surveyors topside, we can let cable out to lower the towfish or bring cable in uh, to raise it in the water column. Of course, the image you see here is uh, certainly a, a really bad day for somebody. Um, the black strip is the actual, the depth between the, the fish uh, and the ocean floor. Uh, and you can see it's actually the towfish is, is losing altitude uh, as it strikes the mud bottom here and then is lifted up as uh, you can see the, uh, the distance between the sonar towfish and the depth increasing after that impact. Sonars don't have to be towed though. Um, a quick slide here on the uh, EdgeTech 6205. It's a multi-phase echo sounder, which is uh, more or less a hybrid between uh, multi-beam systems and side scan systems. It can collect high resolution side scan imagery, but also seafloor uh, bathymetry maps. 
Um, we partnered with the University of Delaware who brought this 6205 to Northern Michigan for a uh, shipwreck survey in 2017 as part of a NOAA's uh, Office of Ocean and Exploration Research Grant. Um, it's shown here being pole mounted to a rigid arm on Laurentian that swings up during transits and then just swings down um, at a 90 degree uh, angle when we're, uh, when we're collecting data. Um, this was the survey and the, uh, and the team and the equipment uh, part of the team uh, that we, um, uh, when we discovered this target too, that we're going to continue to weave through this story. Multi-beam. Um, like side scan, uh, multi-beam echo sounders transmit and receive acoustic waves. They do this by transmitting a sound pulse or a ping uh, through its transmitter at a specific frequency, and then they receive the same pulse through receivers, two parts of this equation. Now, the system processing unit calculates the distance and the time that it took that ping to be transmitted and received, and then they can associate uh, a, a depth value to that ping. Now, multi-beam echo sounders have several transducers um, that exponentially increase the width of that beam. And of course, the, the, the beam being what you see here in this diagram, it's, it's a fan-shaped uh, horizontal collection of pings, each one having um, you know, 400 depth sounding. So quite a lot of data being collected by every single uh, linear foot uh, of ocean bottom that we're mapping with multi-beam. So there is a uh, transmitter and a receiver, and you can see that it's, it's transmitting long, uh, uh, narrow but wide beams, and it receives the beams in a longer sort of fore and aft direction. So we can add time delays to this so the multi-beam can actually receive or listen for uh, additional waves, additional pings, uh, additional beams. So we're basically, what we're doing is we're, we're forming and recording a conical, um, a conical uh, uh, shape data set. So skip through this guy. So, so how does this integrate, right? How do we take these two pieces, a, a, a transmitter and a receiver, what does that look like uh, on a boat? Um, this is a typical uh, wiring diagram of a multi-beam echo sounder survey system. Um, this diagram is actually for a Reson 7125 multi-beam that's currently installed on a National Park Service 30-foot work skiff um, that we're looking forward to working with and surveying uh, on uh, this field season. Now, at first glance, there's there's a lot going on here, right? Lots of arrows, lots of lines, lots of things. Um, but when you divide the diagram into its individual systems, like positioning, right? You can see the orange pause MV they were familiar with, the yellow inertial motion unit, um, GPS antennas are a little uh, conical pancakes. Um, we can see this, the, the individual systems and components that, that make up positioning. The multi-beam itself, uh, sound velocity collection data, the top row is all monitors, right, that are showing what kind of data is going to be uh, displayed on different, uh, different screens. The processing units, the computers where we network all this stuff, the local area network that we're establishing with hubs and switches to be able to connect uh, Ethernet cables to have computers talk to echo sounders and echo sounders talk to computers and vice versa. So we're creating this network where everything is online on its own little um, self-contained network, right? And these are just the different systems um, that I included to show you. It's just an example of, of what the startup season process is to really get this stuff installed. Uh, this is a data, uh, data set collected in 2016 um, showing multi-beam data, what, what it would look like. Um, what's really cool is you can see the nice color gradient uh, chosen here to illustrate higher and lower depth sounding values. Um, just take note of the blue and the uh, sort of darker green pits or depressions in this data set. Um, those are actually sinkholes where the karst limestone layer beneath the lake bottom has been eroded by underground aquifer systems to the point of collapse, causing underwater sinkholes at the bottom of Lake Huron. Incredible way that uh, survey data has become incredibly interesting to geologists and hydrologists and, uh, you know, sinkhole research has been uh, uh, huge, huge for the sanctuary. And, and of course, uh, it's just a, a wonderful thing to be able to partner with um, folks at University of Michigan, Grand Valley State University and others uh, to be able to study these sinkholes and using survey data to find out where they are. 
Um, quick side-by-side -side comparison of multi-beam imagery with uh, an exaggerated color ramp to show the uh, relatively steep slope contour off of the northeastern side of Spectacle Reef in northern Lake Huron. These images were produced last year during a survey set uh, to discover the aircraft remains of Air Force Master Sergeant William J. Wyman, whose Piper supercruiser crashed in this area uh, at the end of February 1959. Um, Wyman tragically uh, spent his last few days um, in the Spectacle Reef Lighthouse. It's an island in the middle of the lake. Um, and so we were uh, set out to, uh, to go try and find uh, what we could uh, about his last, uh, his last few days. And we can absolutely detect targets like an aircraft with multi-beam data sets here on the left. Um, but you can see that the imagery provided by the side scan sonar in the right image gives us a, a much clearer image of the bottom. So great side by side here. Now, a special component of multi-beam echo sounders is the ability to interpret the bathymetric data to give you backscatter. Backscatter represents the strength of the return of the acoustic waves off the ocean floor. So again, this is the same area of the spectacle reef shown in the previous slide, but giving us a whole different data set, right? Map once, use many times. Great example here of how backscatter can be used. Um, this is a fantastic tool developed by uh, our friends at NOAA's National Center for Coastal Ocean Sciences who take backscatter imagery and are able to infer lake bottom characterizations based on the strength uh, of that acoustic return. So oversimplified acoustic waves bounce off a of hard rock differently than they bounce off soft mud. So we've had the pleasure to work with the NCOS team and not only collecting the multi-beam data with them, uh, but then ground truthing their habitat models with video drops. So they can build these benthic habitat maps that are useful to research managers and the public. So they've got video, uh, video images here where you can say, hey, at a certain level of return, quantitatively measured, it will 97% be soft mud or small gravel, large gravel, right? They're, they're, they're separated into categories. And of course, another uh, really great way uh, to use uh, multi-beam and of course, backscatter data. Now, before we dive into uh, kind of a quick conversation on autonomous and remotely controlled platforms, certainly want to introduce uh, the magnetometer. Uh, magnetometers have been uh, religiously used by the maritime archaeology community since the 60s. Um, and for brevity's sake, uh, imagine you're towing an underwater metal detector. Now, mags, magnetometers, can locate ferromagnetic material, iron, and can penetrate the ocean floor, which makes them valuable tools, especially in coastal areas with shifting sands, um, volatile hydrodynamics. And they measure the variation in Earth's magnetic field. So they can pick up magnetic signals emitted from objects with their own magnetic field or disruptions in the uh, permanent magnetism of the area. So mags are, are towed uh, as so they won't pick up that magnetic signature of the research vessel they're on. Uh, on average, you can sort of clear um, the magnetic signature of your metal boat uh, about three times the vessel length. So that's how long you gotta, you gotta tow it behind you. Um, moving on to, to AUVs, in the last 15 years or so, um, autonomous platforms have been uh, an industry focus for collecting hydro data. Um, pictured here is Michigan Tech University's uh, Iver 3. Now, AUVs come in different sizes and payloads. This particular unit features an EdgeTech 6205, which is pretty similar to the interferometric bathy sonar um, that uh, is, 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 uh, is featured with the EdgeTech 6205 um, that we used in 2017. So um, a couple months after we found Target 2, um, we used this to run uh, varied missions at specific targets to gather multiple and varied sonar perspectives. Now, the great thing about AUVs and shipwreck exploration is the relatively fast data confirmation. We could plan a 45 minute mission on the target, send the AUV off in the water, retrieve it, download the survey data, readjust parameters, altitude, vehicle heading, speed, resolution until we were satisfied. So in a given day, we could run five to seven missions on targeted sites, right? Giving us the most amount of archeological data. Now, this is a great shot of uh, Jamie, Chris, and Guy from Michigan Technological University's Great Lakes Research Center. And of course, Michael Bulak from the state of Michigan participating uh, in a typical uh, AUV mission, which is lots of waiting and more waiting until the AUV surfaces and radios to the pilot uh, that its mission is complete and it's ready to be picked up. 
Uh, these are a couple shots from the Ivor 3 uh, that gave us different looks at, at what we were dealing with with Target 2, right? So if we had one sonar image, which was the bottom, like what if we only had that bottom left image? Um, obviously, plenty to be learned from this one image, but having multiple perspectives, of course, helps us narrow down the idea of what it could possibly be uh, and learn more from its, uh, from its bottom side characteristics. Now, like autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, remotely operated vehicles collect data underwater, but as the name implies, ROVs are tethered to a research vessel by fiber optic cable. They can be used for high resolution mapping exercises, but since they're limited by their tether, they aren't used for wide area survey. Um, they come in, of course, all shapes and sizes, and they require, you know, uh, relatively uh, different supporting assets, research vessels, personnel, funding. Um, pictured here is uh, the ROV Hercules, uh, operated by our friends uh, Ocean Exploration Trust off their research vessel Nautilus. Of course, this machine is at the, uh, is, is, is at the, the higher end uh, of units and, and is engineered for deep sea exploration. Now, at a slightly smaller size, um, pictured here is Alpena Community College's uh, Industrial Technology Program's Outland 1000 ROV. Now, unlike Hercules that weighs almost 6,000 pounds, the Outland can be carried by two people. It serves a, a different purpose, um, but is all the more important in our toolbox. Uh, here you can see program director and instructor David Cummins piloting uh, the ROV with student Matt Southwell uh, on the rec site of the Pawabek. Uh, we brought their class to conduct a top to bottom inspection of the mooring system installed at the site. Um, because Pawabek is sunk in about 165 feet of water, the ROV gave us a quick look at the mooring system's health without organizing a technical diving team to go inspect it ourselves. Now, the ROV certainly doesn't replace the need for, archeologic, for archeologist eyes, um, but it complements it nicely. Back to target two. Um, after we discovered Target 2 with the uh, University of Delaware, um, Northwestern Michigan College volunteered their ROV and crew to conduct a visual survey of the site. Um, this tool and, uh, and their expertise uh, gathered some of the first visual images of Target 2 and helped us narrow its possible identity. Um, what we did is we overlaid here, you can see uh, overlaying screen grabs from that video onto uh, builder plans of a possible target uh, known to have wrecked in this area. Uh, special thanks to Hans Van Sumeren and uh, Northwestern uh, Michigan College's Marine Technology Program for their assistance here. Now, beyond AUVs and ROVs, it's, uh, and ROVs, it's worth mentioning an exciting new autonomous uh, platform that NOAA has been utilizing over the last few years, um, autonomous surface vessels. Now pictured here is ASV Ben, uh, operated by the Center for Coastal Ocean Mapping's Joint Hydrographic Center, SeaCom. Uh, They're up in uh, University of New Hampshire. Their operators joined us along with Ocean Exploration Trust last May for an experimental survey off Rogers City. Now Ben uh, here is jet driven and features a, a similar multi-beam system employed uh, on our research vessel Storm. And you'll see here uh, some drone shots shot by David Cummins at Alpena Community College of uh, RV Storm towing Ben out to his survey area. Um, ben has a range of about 12 miles and is constantly monitored and controlled by hydrographers and operators. In that little white utility trailer, uh, there's a handful of scientists in there that are, uh, you know, if, if, if are, are, are perched and ready and monitoring Ben real time as data is being transferred uh, in real time. So. A uh, great opportunity here uh, to, to reduce the manpower and the time required to map shallow coastal zones where you can only see that little piece, uh, that little footprint of the flashlight, so to speak. So in, in uh, last year, we worked in tandem with ASB Ben where uh, we were on storm collecting uh, deeper water multi-beam data, uh, and we were able to cover twice the ground uh, with Ben by our side. So special thanks to uh, Clint Marcus from OCS uh, who helped with that project, uh, in addition to the entire team um, at Ocean Exploration Trust uh, and UNH. So uh, example of a data set here, um, you know, the compact autonomous platform that ASV Ben is capable of producing chart quality bathymetric data sets like this uh, mosaic you can see here. Um, each piece of remo uh, marine remote sensing equipment that I've talked about produces varying levels of data sets, right? And data is of course reviewed real time and processed at basic levels at the end of the day, at the end of a shift, um, and then of course processed in greater detail when time allows, during the winter, after the project is done, et cetera. 
Now this level of processing uh, generates stitched mosaics that show the data collected for that particular day or shift or project. Uh, and when we analyze these mosaics, we're taking rough passes to identify areas or targets of interest, if there are any, um, uh, or areas that lack data quality. Maybe it was a little just too rough that day. We have to clean something up, right? So we're constantly going back and forth looking at this stuff. In the case of target two, um, the data acquired by the side scan sonar, the AUV with Michigan Tech uh, and the ROV with uh, Northwestern Michigan College led us to identify target two as the semi whale back Choctaw uh, that sank in July 1915 after a fatal collision with Wakanda. Now it's worth repeating here that um, you know our marine remote sensing surveys are rarely exclusively based on shipwreck discovery. Um, we're always collaborating with biologists, geologists, chemists, uh, hydrologists, and others who regularly inform these surveys uh, and improve our data collection procedures to help them answer their own research questions. Um, but shipwrecks do pop up from time to time, most recently here in 2017, uh, when we discovered Target 2 positively ID'd as a Choctaw here. And for archaeologists, this is where the work begins. During the sanctuary uh, survey planning and data acquisition stages, our perspective is generally broad. We're looking kind of above that canopy. Um, and if targets like shipwrecks are discovered, the perspective narrows considerably. Um, we'll dissect every kilobyte of data looking for clues to answer archaeological questions like, how did the ship impact the bottom? How wide and what are the contents of its debris field? What's missing from the archaeological site here? And so you, you go through this cyclical process that ensues as questions posed lead to more questions, another review of data, possible answers with more questions, another review of data, reprocessing the data. And it just goes on and on and on until we're building this larger uh, vocabulary and understanding of some of our most treasured archaeological sites here in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So in the case of Target 2 or Choctaw, um, the archaeological analysis and historical research led us to successfully list its shipwreck site on the National Register of, His of Historic Places, which of course is the collection of the nation's most historic sites. Archaeological interpretation, of course, gathered from survey data is also disseminated to the public uh, on the web and uh, in a myriad of other ways, including in exhibits in our uh, 9,000 square foot maritime museum that's free to the public and open year round. I encourage you guys to visit it anytime. And of course, once, uh, once we're past this period and the, and the museum is back up, up and running, you guys should definitely check it out if you haven't. And data is, of course, uh, used in over uh, 100 trail signs, uh, interpretive trail signs located at state parks, beaches, harbors, lighthouses, uh, all over northern Michigan. Um, and the beauty of survey and shipwreck discovery is that it informs and expands our shared history, our connection to the lake, and of course, the, the blue tinted identity that we all share as stewards of the sanctuary and the waters of the Great Lakes. Now, the next slide is a one-minute trailer of a documentary that Sony produced in 2011, where some Saginaw area students joined us to look for Choctaw, actually, back in 2011. Um, and of course, discovering Choctaw in 2017 was incredibly fulfilling as we finished what those students and wreck hunters like Stan Stock had started uh, before them, right? And uh, we're all looking for these things together, right? Dan Fountain and others and Farnquist and, and a whole group um, of, uh, of us are, are, are in this for, for all the same reasons to be able to share and understand uh, remnants of our past that are all part of our identity here. So um, I'd like to play this one minute trailer and then we're gonna jump to a, uh, a concluding slide where we'll have a question and answer. So. Uh, without further ado, here's a, a trailer for Project Ship Hunt. I must note that the full version of this documentary is available for free on the Sanctuary's YouTube channel. The hazards in Thunder Bay have accumulated a great number of shipwrecks. If you go in that water, you don't have long to live. That's the reality, even for us today. This is a massive water highway. Lots of ships, bad weather, fog, human error. Accidents are bound to happen. Hence, we're Shipwreck Alley. There's a lot of shipwrecks, but not all of them have been found. And so what we're gonna do is go find one. Today, 
thanks to the power of these Sony VAIO laptops. With a second generation Intel Core processor, we're able to take millions of data points, peer down thousands of feet, and find shipwrecks. And yes, there will be adventure. We was gonna do something out of the box, something different, something that people don't normally do. I'm a small town guy. I've never done something this big. I thought this would be a cool experience to learn things beyond my horizon. Oh, well, you got something right in front of you. Hey, you guys see that? What are those? That's it. This isn't just a ship hunt. This is a lesson about life. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, presentation. Thanks, you guys, so much for tuning in. Um, Dick, I'll, I'll toss it to you if you want to help proctor the uh, question and answer session. Right. I'm trying to get my uh, things back together here. Now, uh, Betty, I, there was one, one question I sent in about some uh, technical details of uh, sonar angles, and Phil, thank you for answering that. Uh, people, uh, folks online or on Facebook, you can go uh, type something in the chat function, or if there are no questions via chat, if you want to unmute yourself and ask Phil a question, that'd be great. We did have one question, Phil, come in on uh, Facebook. How deep's the Choctaw? Uh, Choctaw is roughly 300 feet of water. That's pretty deep. And I've got, um, yeah, Dick, I see, see a couple questions here I, I can jump in on. Um, how many degrees spread do your sonar devices have? Um, uh, the 2040C that, that we're rolling on RV Storm uh, has a 140 degree beam angle. Um, Steve Wilson, great to have you asks, do you also record the depth of water so this information can be coordinated with NOAA boarding charts? Absolutely. So the data that we have is used for, for many reasons, that being uh, one of them. We're able to take our hydrographic data sets and then ship it um, to the hydrographers at NOAA's Office of Coast Survey, and they'll be able to take that data uh, and then update nautical charts uh, with it. So being able to um, uh, line up uh, and, uh, and align workflows, performance, equipment better with OCS helps uh, usher that along, but absolutely. Okay, Phil, we have a, or Phil, uh, yeah, Phil, we have a question from uh, Martin Klein on the Facebook. Uh, the question was, were any wrecks found with the Ben survey? Hmm? Um, Sure. Marty, great to have you. Uh, Marty Klein, of course, the father of side scan sonar. So uh, great that you uh, great that you could tune in. Uh, no, and in fact, the um, the um, ASB Ben survey was coastal, um, and uh, it was it was geared towards uh, sort of triaging uh, what a survey would look like. Um, you know, using a, a 2040p multi beam uh, on that device and being able to um, you know uh, work out techniques and methods like running all the sound velocity data uh, from RV Storm for Ben doing all the casts uh, and so it was uh, it, it was a great experimental survey and, and our first time using uh, an autonom autonomous service vessel. Yeah. Yeah. We have a few more items on the Zoom uh, group chat. Uh, thanks Bob for letting us know how you're exploring Lake Avalon. That's great. That's great. Um, Lucy Green wants to know what your favorite shipwreck is. I think uh, if, if anybody who knows me out there, uh, I would be, uh, I think a lightning bolt would come through this, uh, through this building right now if I didn't say the Puavik. So I got to go to old trusty, uh, the passenger package freight propeller uh, sunk in 1865. See. Any other questions, send them via chat or open up your mic and just go ahead and ask Phil. This is Bob Disher in, in Hillman. I'd like to thank uh, 
the pre presenter, Dick, uh, along with your, um, like Phil. Um, we do use the tow board out here for our kids and they've, uh, uh, they've done some, some interesting finds in our lake, uh, out here in Lake Avalon. Absolutely. That's great. Uh, tow boarding is a lot of fun, actually. Uh, it's, it's a blast really. You feel like you're, you're flying underwater. Uh, so that's, that's great to hear that you guys are, are using it out there. That's fun. Yeah. I want to shout out to Katie Wolf. We're going to, we'll call you Katie. There's our neighbors out here. Uh, Tyler Hartmeyer asks, do you ever come across water snakes in your dives? Thank goodness, no. Um, that would end the dive pretty quickly, I'm afraid. We did see a mud puppy in our lake, though, a handful of years ago. Uh, there was a question on Facebook from uh, Sharon Carlos. Uh, did you find the airplane? We did not. Um, and airplanes are, 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 are tough to find. You know, they, they often are, are coming and hitting the water surface uh, at much higher altitudes. And they're unfortunately coming in, coming in pretty hot. So um, they're usually a lot more scattered in their archaeological signature. Um, but no, we, uh, we weren't able to find it there on that northeastern side. Here's all the. Uh... Just a quick note here uh, as people are signing out, the Association of Lifelong Learners, we've been doing online programmings now for about a month, and we have a few more weeks lined up. So if you are interested in any of our programs, just send us an email to uh, all at alpinacc.edu and we'll put you on our distribution list for uh, future programs. I don't see any more questions. Bill, you want to wrap it up? Let's do it. Appreciate all of you guys tuning in. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, of course, my email is here. And uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Great. Thank you very much from the Association of Lifelong Learners. Uh, we had quite a few participants today. We probably pushed over 100 people between uh, uh, Zoom and uh, Facebook Live. So we appreciate everybody's uh, checking in and seeing what's happening. And uh, from my perspective, Phil, it was a great presentation. Having uh, dabbled a little bit with sonar myself in the past, it's a uh, very interesting topic. So uh, the one last moment for any questions. Oops, we got one uh, on Facebook here from Susie Elliott. Uh, what deteriorates uh, shipwrecks the most, current or rust? Currents or rust? Uh, shipwreck deterioration, you know, it certainly varies in, uh, by environment, right? Uh, the reason that we've got these incredible intact uh, preserved shipwrecks here in the Great Lakes uh, is cold, fresh water. So here uh, we've got a, uh, a really great environment for shipwreck preservation, but of course, salt, teredo worms, um, biological material uh, and organisms uh, eat away at wooden and organic materials in the oceans a whole lot quicker. So they're at very, at very levels. Um, but in general, up here in the Great Lakes, um, they're, in, uh, they're in generally better condition here uh, than elsewhere uh, where archaeology is happening. We had a question about zebra on uh, Zoom chat about uh, zebra mussels and are they deteriorating the cultural resource, underwater cultural resources? It's a great question uh, and it's one that's, that's sort of hard to answer and it's got a few different perspectives. Um, are they deteriorating underwater cultural resources? Well, if you take it from the perspective of mussels attaching themselves to wooden shipwrecks, uh, yeah, uh, th there is damage that happens, especially when those muscles are pulled off. Um, but as far as them impacting uh, cultural resources on, on, on a larger level, if they're left uh, undetermined, uh, undisturbed, um, I think the verdict is still out there. So uh, we're, of course, trying to, trying to monitor these sites and, and watch as, as zebra and quagga mussels now 
uh, populations are, are ever growing. And really what their, uh, what their effect is on shipwrecks is, uh, is sort of yet to be determined. Well, thanks, Dick. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Phil. It's uh, been a great program, and hopefully we can do some more in the future. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Bye.